Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to the final day of the Climate Change COP26 and Beyond Conference, where over three days we've explored the causes, implications and future considerations of climate change in the wake of COP26. The conference is part of the university's action on environment and sustainability, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm very pleased to be able to introduce today's events. Climate change will have an impact on all of us, and as the previous sessions have highlighted, it will affect the way we live, work and study for the foreseeable future. The lives of our younger generations and those of their children will be very different to life as we know it today. COP26 has shown that the world is largely united in their commitment to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. This target is very ambitious and requires action at a scale and a pace never seen before and at every level of society and governance. Young people in particular have an extremely important role to play in driving a sustainable future, not just by being vocal and demanding change as we've seen through individual activists like Greta Thunberg and other vocal um, participants in the debate, but also by being the change that this world needs. And being an environmentally literate young person today is not only a right, but a necessity. The students here today will be the decision makers, leaders, consumers, teachers and citizens of tomorrow. And you need to be given the tools and knowledge to help you face the challenges that lie ahead. All the while building back a future where we can all thrive in harmony with the planet. This is no easy task, but it is a reality and extremely urgent. And it's urgent that we all work together, which is why I'm so grateful not only to all of you who are attending, but also our fantastic youth speakers who are doing incredible work championing, championing environmental action and protection. Victoria Uday is a current nursing student with us here at the University of Hertfordshire and is a former Miss Goodwill Nigeria climate change ambassador. We're delighted to welcome her this morning to talk about her experiences with youth climate activism and awareness. We also have Ora Moloye Ayola, who's a University of Hertfordshire alumni, UK and environmental advocate. As a dedicated environmental campaigner, who also attended COP no less, we are honoured that he's able to join us to share lessons from COP26 and the role of knowledge and education in driving a sustainable future. I'm also very happy that we have Sarah Flynn joining us today. Sarah is the Associate Director of Learning and Teaching at the University and she will share why it's important to be a sustainability driven graduate and why employers love it. Tackling climate change is undoubtedly the biggest challenge of our time and it's so important that we as a university are active in improving our environment, taking progressive action and improving the world we live in. It's a complex and challenging task, but there is a part for all of us to play. Our whole institution approach and climate vision are central to what happens next for the university. And whether the journey is starting for you today or you're an experienced climate activist, there is lots for you to enjoy in the sessions. Day three is entitled Generation Green, a day to learn about the role of activism, green education, and how younger people can get involved or lead in tackling climate change. So have a great day. And don't forget to pick up a copy of the book that's part of our Connect Common Reading Programme this year, Diane Cook's book, The New Wilderness, with the theme of climate change and sustainability. So thank you for allowing me to introduce this session and have a great day. And I look forward to hearing about it from you later. Thank you. Great. I hope you enjoyed that introduction from Mari. Um, and um, I know that she's very keen to see the recordings of all these sessions afterwards. Um, so just a couple of um, notes before we start. Um, I already mentioned the Q&A for anyone who's joined us um, in the last couple of minutes. Please do use the Q&A to ask any of our participants um, or our speakers any questions. Uh, we'll try and address them if we can. And if we need to, we can type um, or we can get one of the speakers to answer them live. Um, so you won't be able to speak unless we unmute you and equally the chat functionality has been 
uh, disabled. So, but please do use the, the Q&A function so we can ask and have some um, discussion with our speakers. So without further ado, I'm going to um, now hand over to Victoria. So our first speaker, I'll let her tell you a bit more about herself um, and then she can um, tell us a little bit about her experiences in youth activism. So Victoria, over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, like you all know, my name is Victoria O'Day. I am a final year nursing student, MSc. Um, for my Ms. Goodwill Nigeria Climate Change 2016. Um, I've been a climate change activist from the year 2013, you know, when I had my first degree in environmental management. Um, I've had a lot of campaign on tree planning, lots of um, climate change awareness in Nigeria, recycling projects, which we tagged um, from trash to cash. You know, so there's been a lot of um, act, I've been I've been around with, with regards to climate change. I've attended COP different, I think um, COP 25, and then this year's own as well. So um, in my whole life, there's been some sort of way I've engaged with climate change, one way or the other. So yes, I'm sure a lot of people will be wondering why nothing. You are a nursing student and climate change. Don't worry, I'll get to that at some point. I explained that to you at some point. Okay, without further ado, um, let me just start. Um, we are aware of the challenges and risk presented by the climate change crisis, and also not forgetting the opportunity this um, presents to us to proffer solution. The world's population is 7.8 billion people, and of this population, the youth make up 1.8 billion between the ages of 10 to 24. Our message is very clear. The older generation has failed us. They have left us to pay with our very own future. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres said, and I quote, my generation has largely failed until now to preserve both justice in the world and to preserve the planet. It is your generation that must make us to be accountable, to make sure that we don't betray the future of humankind. There's been a lot of distress globally as ice sheets and glaciers continue to melt. And as a result, global sea level rise and has also accelerated and reached its highest level since measurements started. Ocean heat hits a new record with widespread marine heat waves, heat acidification, and the oxygen, the, the oxygen, excuse me, heat acidification, all these harm the marine life, ecosystem and coral leaves. High impact from drought and flood affects all continents. We are not left, left out from it, whether directly or indirectly. More people are exposed to heat stress, food insecurity, water shortages, tropical cyclones wreak great havoc environmentally and economically in countries such as the Bahamas, um, Japan, Mozambique, wildfire burned in pristine Arctic while smokes from Australia traveled the globe. Mind you, this might not get to us personally, but it's affecting us indirectly, whether or not we have direct contact with, with all of this. Seven out of 10 million new internal displaced were triggered by weather and climate related disasters in 2019. Of course, we also know that 2019 was recorded as the hottest year, second hottest year in, um, in the year, I think with the records. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide remain at record level, locking in climate change for future generation. Where does this leave us? As young people, where do we go from here? What do we do? What is our role to salvage the current global climate crisis? We are fortunate to have the chance to actively, you know, get actively involved in decision-making processes, both on local, national, and at international level. Let's bring it back home to UH. Are we involved in 
the decision-making processes with regards to environment? How involved are we in policy making? What are the role we play at the table? Well, we can become actively involved in grassroots activism and participate in conservation projects. Climate change activism has played a very important role in influencing the legislature to enact laws that aim to bring to protect the environment. It has caused an increase in climate change awareness among young people. Um, chapter 25 of Agenda 21, which was adopted at the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro, reads as follows. It says, it is imperative that youth from all parts of the world participate actively in all relevant levels of decision-making process because it affects their lives today and has implications for their future in addition to their intellectual contribution and their ability to mobilize support, the bring unique perspective that needs to be taken into account. Similarly, paragraph 153 of the plan of implementation adopted at the World Summit on Sustainable Development held in Johannesburg in 2002, indicates the need to promote and support youth participation in programs and activities relating to sustainable development through supporting youth council or the equivalent and by encouraging the establishment where they do not exist. The need to include youth voices has become more pressing than ever as young people whose future are threatened by accelerating global heat are increasingly demand in demand actions towards a more just, equitable, and climate resilient society. We must sit at the table when decisions are taken and be included in climate related policy formulation as well as its implementation. Do you know that as youth, you are well placed to promote climate change awareness? This is simply because we have access to information about the urgency of the current situation than our elders. How often do we use our technological gadgets to create awareness? We spend a very long time on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms. Do we ever remember to make a post or engage with climate-related posts? If we don't, it's not too late. The time is now. Today is the morning of our lives. Let's begin to take charge of our actions. As youths, we have greater stake in long-term sustainability. And this is an area we need to take the lead because our nation matters. Our action also matters. And we are the agents of change. We need to be the forerunners of this agenda. And we must act together now to protect our world. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Victoria. That was a really impassioned and a really insightful um, presentation. I think it sounds like you've had lots of experiences that you could talk for hours about. I think we've got questions that we'd like to ask about um, all different areas yeah. relating to what you've spoken about. But I, um, I think you, you know, you really hit home that message that the youth is really does have an important play part to play. Um, and I think coming out of COP and Oromo Yoli might touch on this now. Um, you know, there are two parts to COP. There's the, what happens inside the COP buildings and then everything that's happening outside. And that outside. can have just as big as an impact. Um, I think we've had a couple of questions. So, um, okay. um, sorry, let me just, um, so here's a question. What do you think are the issues young people are most concerned about regarding climate change? So do you think, young people generally think it's uh, plastic pollution, natural disasters. So for young people, what is the thing that they are most concerned about in terms of climate change? Yes, so it depends on individuals now. It depends on what one should be concerned about at every point in time. Now, for some people like myself, what I'm particularly um, concerned about is getting out there, being included in decision-making 
for some other person, it could be that um, there are lots of plastic on the streets. For some other person, it could be that um, there, there is um, um, flooding, heat waves. For example, I'm sure in, in, um, in Australia, they are more concerned about the wildfire going on. So it depends on individuals and it depends on nations. But collectively, we all have one goal, one agenda to save the, the planet. That is our collective agenda, even though we all have branches to all mm. of this. So yes, it depends on you as an individual, what role you want to play or what you should be, what you want to get concerned in. So it mustn't necessarily be just plastic. Yeah. yeah it could be planting, it could be, um, you know, planting of trees, creating awareness, getting young people from the very grassroots level, educating them about what climate change is about and what role they should play and letting them know that cutting down of trees, you know, the impact of cutting down of trees and all of that. So it depends on individuals and then depends on um, nations as well. Mm. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, it will depend on what's relevant to them and their lives and where they live. But equally, like you said, it does, you know, you need to step back and see how it all connects in the bigger picture as well. Um, yeah. So thank you. Um, I've just got another question as well. Um, and it asks, what do you think is the biggest barrier or challenge for students today when it comes to engaging in the environmental debate and to being heard? Sorry, take that again. So what is the biggest um, challenge or barrier for students today or young people today when it comes to engaging in the environmental debate? So all the examples you said about, you, you know, people should be engaging at grassroots grassroot level. What grassroot do you think level, is stopping yeah. students or what is, what is the challenge in getting people to that um, point? Okay, I think what is actually stopping students is not taking the bold step. Some people feel they are not confident. When I get there, what will I do? What role will I play? Will I be looked down on? One of the greatest challenges, um, self-confidence. I'm sure that, you know, like I said in my, in my presentation, we all have this opportunity to be there, to be on the table with these people. We have, the, we have that opportunity. So we shouldn't relax, we shouldn't relent. We should take every, every step and you know, get out there, let them know how this is affecting you as an individual. Let them know how it's affecting you as a youth, how this is impacting the world. So I think what is actually the biggest challenge is we not taking the bold step to get out okay. there. So we need to actually start, when you go to COP, you see a lot of older people, a lot of older people. What, what are young people doing? Why can't they take part? Why can't they participate? Why can't they be there? So I think it starts with us, you know, taking the bold step of attending conferences, being in this kind of um, session right now. I'm sure this was publicized to everyone on campus, but we just have a couple of students that are here. So we need to also play a bigger role in, you know, we have to keep encouraging people to come out, come out, come and take part. Let's do these things together. Yeah, so that's it. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, so do you think then that young people and students have the guidance or the support that they need to help them find their place in, in sort of youth activism? Do, they, do you think the information is out there? So if they're interested, do, you know, to guide them where to go or where to find information, or do you think it's sort of, do they find it quite overwhelming and they don't really know where to start? Um, Okay, um, I'll always buttress the importance of starting from the grassroots level. You know, we have, um, we have a society on campus, for example. We have this society that, you know, caters for anything that has to do with climate change. We don't even need to get so overwhelmed with going all, all the way to the UN site or any of those um, external organizations. Let's start from our home. Let's start from our own house from campus, from UH, we can begin from there and expand and know, okay, I have joined the society. What is there for me? How do I get more information? I wouldn't, you know, feel, you get guidance from people who are already experienced, who are already, who have been there. So no one gets too overwhelmed with a lot of information. We have the opportunity to get so many information, so much on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. That is why when I said in my presentation, how often do we engage with most of the climate change posts on social media because every day, every day, there are things going out on Instagram and on Facebook. If you turn on your notification, I'm sure in a day you could get up to 20 or 30 notifications with something that has to do with climate change. So um, yes, you can actually start from 
joining the society and you know getting involved in what we're doing great thank you and i was wondering actually on the back of that um uh, zoe if you wouldn't mind maybe sending um or putting the email the sustainability department's email um so any students on here if they'd like to know more about the society or ways that they can get involved at the qh uh then please email zoe and she can maybe put the email address in the chat great thank you so much victoria there are a couple more questions but i think i'd like to hold on to those until the other speakers have okay. um given their presentations because i think they could we could be interesting to get their perspectives on those as well so for now thank you so much That's all right. and i'm going to You're welcome um, thank you. Move over to our next speaker, so Ormayone, who's come to join us. He's an alumni, as Mari said. Um, he attended COP and he's, you know, we're really excited to hear his take on that and to see what we can learn from that and how we can move forward. So we're really pleased that you've uh, been able to join us today. Um, and I'm going to hand over to yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Uri Moloi Ayola. I'm a former student um, at the University of Edfoshe. I did um, water and environmental management, and I've been an environmental advocate since 2014. I was privileged to be a UN observer um, at the PASTA COP26. Yes. So, and I'm really delighted to be here to, you know, um, learn from Victoria Udi and other other people that have joined. I'm thankful to the, to the um, participants and the organizers for, you know, bringing up this kind of initiative. And I would just like to share my lessons from COP26 and um, the role of youth, knowledge and education. Yes. So um, let's talk about climate change. You know, this morning while, while I was preparing, I, I um, I just did a quick check on what climate change is really, to be very honest. And what I saw was climate change is just, is just more of an oak, just more than meat. So when we say we're fighting climate change, it, it can get very confusing that is climate really the issue? I think the main issue we should pass across is system change, system change, because climate change is uh, climate, for example, is a bit weather condition of a place you know, over a long period of time. And if you talk about climate change, for example, you've been hearing, you know, this particular concept since, you know, over 40 years. Let's talk about the Brutland um, Convention, the Rio de Janeiro Convention in 1992. You know, we've got the Paris, you know, agreement in 2015. So we've been having, you know, this climate change conversation for many years now. However, we found that there has not been any meaningful progress, any meaningful progress. So I'll start by saying, we need more of system change rather than climate change because climate change, the climate is just existing on its own. We humans are the major actors in terms of, you know, this, this whole pyramid. This climate is just, is more of um, a victim of this, whole, of this whole situation. So I'll say more of a system change. And um, what is our goal in fighting climate change, for example? The goal is to cut down um, greenhouse gas emission to 1.5 degrees by 2030. That has been the goal. And in particular, I'm, I'm focused on the youth. I'm focused on the youth. I'm very, very focused on the youth. And um, when you look at um, who the youth is, we're talking about the younger generations to older generations, um, let's say 25 years, yes. And when you look at it, you, you see that um, we've got two sects here. We've got the younger generations and the older generations. So I think there's, that, there's a bit of divide in who is fighting who. So you hear you talking about all oh, the, the other generations, they failed us. Well, I would like to, my views are, you know, are, are, are diverted here. While I know that the other generations have not really done a lot in terms of fighting climate change and conserving the environment, I also say that um, the youth need to really step up. And while I was preparing, I just discovered something that in each generation, you know, they always have one thing or the other they fight for. For example, in the older generation, they fought for industrialization, they fought for human rights, they fought for, you know, slave, slave trade. So what I see now is climate change is the fight for the youth, is the fight for, you know, the younger generations. Because when you look at some of the goals, look at the 2030 goals, the 2050 goals, many of the older generations we see today might not even be in active, active service by that time. Or some of them might not even be alive. 
But let's talk about even the leaders we, uh, we try to fight, fight. Most of them may not even be in active power by that time. So we, we, are, we are left as the ones that are the, are the victims that will fight at that particular point in time. So I think climate change is a fight that the youth need to really take up, need to, need to really take up. And um, I was privileged to also attend COI 16, which I was a volunteer. And when you look at COI 16, I was there, I met many youth all over the world, you know, from global South countries to global North countries, developed countries, you know, many youth that, are, you know, they, they had inspiring ideas. Some of them have begun to, you know, implement some of their ideas and you can only marvel at the skills and the expertise that youth really have. But what has been the problem so far? When, I, when then when I moved over to COP26, that was a week after, and I saw something very, very different over there. I saw more or let's say 80% of older people in there, and they are all deliberating about a 2030 goal, a 2050 goal, which I know that many of them might not even be there, even if they are alive by that particular point in time. They might not be in active service to begin to implement, push some of these agendas. So many of us were lobbying to even get into the negotiation rooms and you know the meetings, and you you're fighting for you you know you you try to conserve the you know an environment that you may not even be there in the next forty years or thirty years, and um let's look at um the the, the main goal for example, one point five degrees, and if you look at it that that is just a figure that has that has, has um scientific backing. If you look at the ones that EU, for example, or many of these political governments have taken over, they will talk about two degrees, you know, Celsius. That's what they've been over. So there's, there has not been that, you know, um, agreement to either is 1.5 degrees or two degrees because they see that the, imp the impact of two degrees will favor many of the economic, you know, many of the economic biases. Talking about 1.5 degrees, even at one degrees, we still find a lot of, you know, deaths and displacement of people over the years that will come up to even 2,100. So even at 1.5 degrees, we can't even afford to even cost more warming again. And now we're still having that argument on if it's two degrees or 1.5 degrees. So it leads me to my, to my next, to my next points. I've given the introduction, evidence over ignorance. It gives to my next point, which is awareness. So when you want to fight, for example, a particular concept, um, this is a concept that I've used, you know, to fight different things, you know, from career to many different things. It's always about awareness, because you're fighting climate change, which is a new, like, more of a new virus. Let's, let's take, for example, the COVID-19 virus. It just came from nowhere. Either too, it has been existing before. It has been over, you know, you know, various millennials, but we don't know it. It just came into our awareness. That was last year. So the first thing you need to do when you want to fight climate change is awareness. Awareness of what? Awareness of what it is. You have to be aware of what it is impact. And now we're beginning to see the impact nowadays now. But you can't just stop at awareness. And that's where I think the youth have just focused on. Or, you know, climate strikes, climate protests and walks. Why that is good? But that's only just one aspect of awareness. So I, I said here, yeah, we've got awareness by consciousness, which is you being aware. For example, this is my laptop. I can be aware of my laptop being in front of me here. But... We have to move over from just awareness by consciousness to awareness by knowledge. So when I know that this laptop is in front of me, and I know the importance of this laptop and I know the impact of this laptop. Then it gives me more information on how I'll protect it. For example, I don't want to drop it on the floor. So I think most of what we've seen so far is we are just aware by consciousness that climate, climate, climate is changing, but we're not aware by knowledge of the impact of climate change. Because to be to be very honest, but if you're aware of you know um, of it by knowledge, then you know, you will get more people fighting against climate change because this is um, this is our world. Talking about climate change, it affects many aspects of the society. You know, our survival, food, clothing, and shelter. So you see, in the coming years, 10, 20 years, it's going to be really very, very massive. The impact of climate change, and you know, thanks be to Ed that is not giving us a bit of warning now to let us you know take actions. And also, I was privileged to. To be among the global youth, you know, um, population that presented this youth statement to the United Nations General Assembly President, and he made mention of one thing. He made mention of hope. You know, he made mention of hope as a key mantra for you know for the fight against climate change and also for his presidency. And while I agree with that, I will say for for youth like me and for other youth, it's good for us to move beyond the level of hope to courage.
Because when you talk about hope, it's speaking from that his generation that you know they had time to you know implement many of these policies I talked about: industrialization, slave trade, you know, you know, um, urban urban planning. Those are those were the times that you can talk about hope. But now we need courage. So we can't, we can't just rely on hope again to fight climate change. We need courage to attack many of these systems for us to switch from conventional practices to sustainable practices. You need courage because it's not something that it's, it's, it's about loss and effect, but the loss of not fighting climate change is greater than the loss of fighting climate change. So when, when you are aware by knowledge, you are able to make, you know, to analyze the impact of climate change. You're able to analyze the effect it has on when you're not fighting it. So what I see so far is many youth, we know what we want, for example. We want to fight climate change. We want climate justice. We want to be giving voices. We want to be giving a space at the table. But we don't really know what it takes to get what we want. So that's the, that's, there's a huge knowledge gap between us getting what we want and, you know, and what it takes, the means for which we can get it. When you are aware of the means through which you can get what you want, then you are better informed to make more change. Then I move over to, so I said awareness here. So um, as I was saying earlier, and I said, if you want to fight a particular concept, first of all, it's awareness. So as much as we want to get ourselves involved in climate strikes and protests, which is good. And I discovered that, you know, since COP finished, when COP 26 finished, um, I've not heard really of many works and protests again. So that's to tell you that, you know, the climate works and, you know, strikes itself is not sustainable. It's part of the, the awareness program, but you must, you know, transcend more than that stage of just working. For example, in Glasgow, I was part of even many of the thousands of youth all over the world that, you know, we did marching strikes and protests and we got ourselves on the, on the news, people heard about us, you know, and, you know, we shook, we shook Glasgow, isn't it? But now everyone has traveled back to his own country. We've not had any much, you know, um, development, but climate is still changing. So it tells you that climate strikes, they're good. Climate work is good, but we have to move more than that to so knowledge. And that's why I really appreciate the University of Ed for bringing up this program because it's the, the, the major um, player in this fight against climate change in, in um, the um, academic institutions, from universities to technical colleges to training, training institutions, they, they are going to be very involved in the coming future. And that also I was disappointed at COP26 because I saw a very little or no representation from academic institutions. You know, I was expecting to see many of the top institutions over there, you know, Oxford, Art for Share, um, Harvard, but I didn't see many of the representation there. I also, you know, in the you saw you know, indigenous people, youths coming up. So that's that's one place I am or one thing I want us to really notice is that in the coming years, in the, in the academic institutions, University of Ed for Share, many other institutions are going to be very, very involved. And let's go over to the next stage which I talked about here transformation so now we are aware of what we want we know the knowledge gap we know where we want where we want to go to we want to fight climate change climate justice on for five degrees by 20 you know by the end of the century we want to face out greenhouse gas emission fossil fuel cars we know all those things now so what is, what does it take to fill in that knowledge gap is a stage i call transformation the youth need to be really involved in transformation because as much as we want to fight, fight climate change as much as we want to be at cop 26 speaking and being a leader for tomorrow, you don't just you know, um, do all those things by passion. You need superior knowledge. So you need to immerse yourself into superior knowledge. That's why it's now, it's not negotiable, negotiable, you know, negotiable again for you to see you don't want to go to school again. And I found out that many youth now do, are not even, they are discouraged about learning. And when you look at you know, um, transformation in terms of generational transformation, and uh, you read books like Mataman Gandhi, People like Mahatma Gandhi and talks about if you want to change your world, change yourself. And um, people like Mother Teresa of Kakota will say, if you want to change your world, go back and love your family. So it comes back to self. So if you really want to fight climate change, you have to you know, look at it from inward. What can you do to help your environment? So what I said here was, I'll prefer to plant a tree than to go for a, you know, a climate strike because I fight climate change more by planting a tree by attending a climate work or a strike. So you need to be really involved in transformation. You know, put yourself into that system that gives you more superior knowledge on what you can really do. So because when you meet a youth, for example, telling you, I don't want to eat toast again because I don't want to, you know, um, um, emit carbon or um, CO2. It shows you the level of knowledge that youth is, um, the youth has. That's, that's a low knowledge. That's a low knowledge. So when you look at it, 
instead of just saying you don't want to eat toast again, rather say you want a season that supplies you toast from the bakery to where you are to your finished product. You can outsource it by, in, by less emission or no emission at all. When you talk about that, that's possible. Because if you're saying, for example, the other generation, they are flying jets, they're flying planes. All of us, then we are, we are, we are, we are victims of it because, for example, I flew to Glasgow. So I, I've contributed to climate change. So instead of saying the older generation flew jet, I also flew to, you know, to Glasgow. The younger generation, we all took car, you know, cars and all that. We all, we, all, we all emit. So it's not a question of if you're not emitting or not. And if you look at um, a statistics, for example, last year it was COVID-19 pandemic. And um, many of the old world were on lockdown, were shut down, the economy was shut down. When you look at it, it was just about, I think, what, less than 1% emission. We are, you know, per year, we, are, uh, we emit 50 billion tons of CO2. And last year, it just went down, went, went down by 1%. What, what, it, what, what, what that, does that tell us? It tells us that even if we don't drive cars for one year, climate is going to change. The, the, effect, the effect is already built up already. So it's not a matter of stopping something or not. It's more of a transformation stage, a system change. That's why I said earlier on, the system change that revolves the way we live our lives. It has to be a revolution. You can't just randomly take that to just one place and say, oh, want to, as much as fight, you know, facing our fossil fuel is good, it won't necessarily fight climate change to the, to the amount we want. And let's look at it. Once you would, um, uh, are being involved in that transformation stage, that's where we are now. University, for example, you learn many new things, and I charged, you know, University of Atfashe, for example, and other investors to really have a, a thing called a revolution and a revision of many of their syllabuses and, you know, their mode of um, teaching. For example, many of the projects we, we do during MSc, PhD, and, you know, BSc, even at secondary school levels, they love the challenge to just, you know, um, conventional practices, for example. So I think the academic institution should highly discourage projects and initiatives that have not got any sustainable initiative in its agenda. That's one thing I think the academic institution can push forward. Because when you, for example, find a, a student wanting to work on a project that, that is going to, the effect is going to pollute the environment, you should discourage it immediately. That's the way to fight climate change. We should promote more initiatives and projects that have sustainability in its contents. That's the way academic institution can help us, you know, become more aware by knowledge and through transformation. And I move on to the next thing, which is the empowerment. So the greatest need of a transformed youth is empowerment because it's really frustrating when you've got the knowledge now, you've transformed and you're able to, you're able to implement and you can't, you don't have the necessary um, apparatus to really implement many of your ideas. So we need spaces on, you know, the decision-making table. We need, we need, we need to be giving, we need to be giving platforms, you know, that we can express many of our initiative ideas. That's, that's why so it's about awareness, transformation and empowerment. Those are the stages that we need. And I said climate change is about fight against deforestation, plastic waste, pollution and many of the things, you know. And let's do, go to the next stage, which is scaling. So as if you become an empowered youth, you know, the next thing will be scaling. So I met many youths during COP26 and COP16. They've got many initiatives from different African countries to Latin American countries, to European countries, you know, to Global South and Global North countries. They've got this particular system that is working that has been able to maybe reduce CO2 or bring in new ways of living. And I'm wondering, why can this thing not be scaled up to maybe, for example, a regional level? So many of our youths and also not just youths, the innovations we have now are just on a very small scale. And to fight climate change, climate change is a global phenomenon, but has got its effects across different regions, manifesting in different ways. So, for example, in Australia, you find more of heat waves, but for example, maybe in a country that is close to the coast, you find more flooding. So it's, it's just the all climate change, but has got different phenomenon. So we need to really look at how we can scale many of our new initiatives and ideas to regional standards and to national standards. So as much as you can say you're affecting climate change by planting a tree in your, in, your back, in your backyard, why that is good, but it's not really, it's really inconsequential in the order of things in the whole global phenomenon. So we need to begin to scale these our ideas that we've got that are really working now, that they, they have the sustainability focus in this agenda. We need to begin to scale it to, to more, you know, to more higher levels, you know, more than local levels now, to regional levels, to state levels, to national levels. And uh, let's look at the next, which is adaptation finance. We need finance because as much as you want to scale, if you don't have the finance to scale it, that would be that, that that's it's it looks like you're not doing anything. So we need more finance to bring in use this new 
these new ideas. And I and I heard you to, you know, some of my presentations I made after quite 16 and 26 that sustainability, for example, looking at sustainability, which is people, planet, and profits. Many youth are focused on just people and planets. We've taken size to profit. We're not looking at profit. And that has been the opposite in terms of our older generation. They are focused more on profits. You understand? So we, they're focused more on profits. So by the time we begin to look at the, the profit aspect of our initiative, rather than just passion, rather profits, then we begin to make more impact that way. When you say, for example, what is the economic impact of your initiative on, for example, a locality? Can you bring in more jobs? Can you, you know, can you um, bring in more income for the government, more revenue for the government? That's what we have to begin to do as a youth. And also as other bodies, for example, University of Edge for sure. We've got many thousands of students across different academic institutions that have done really quality projects that if scaled up could make impact, for example, in a region. But many of our projects just get, you know, we, 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 we do these projects. And um, why some might get finance to do the projects and they achieve the, you know, the motive of, of that project, but some of them don't get scaled up. So we wonder what's the, what's the importance of, for example, doing an MSc project if it's sustainable in its focus, but it can be scaled up to, for example, regional levels. So we have to begin to look at that. And also the regulatory bodies. If you look at many of our regulatory bodies uh, we have right from time, they were not focused on I think, climate change. For example, if you look at, I think in the US, we've got the um, um, facing out um, greenhouse gas emission, for example. They were not focused on fighting climate change. They were just focused on just reducing um, emissions. But if we have to have that review, that review of our regulatory bodies, for example, they have to be sensitized and all that. And if you look at regulatory bodies, for example, you look at the Paris Climate Accord and you find out that many countries, about 196 countries, agreed to the Paris Climate Agreement. And what did you find? Across, I think, 2017, we had a new government in the US and they backed out from... Um, from Paris Climate Agreement, it dragged back everything. That was because there was no regulatory body to fight against this thing to push implementation. So I really think we need a regulatory body other than the UN that can enforce some of this form of this agenda that will begin to enforce nations to you know to make commitment and also meet their commitment because it's more than just making commitments. We at Glasgow we had a Gla Glasgow Climate Pact, but what you discovered is in the next three four years we may have new change in government and some. Of a government will tell you they don't believe in climate change again and it drags back everything especially for the polluting countries which i don't want to mention names so it depends so we have to have a regulatory process that can enforce enforce some of these commitments that you must do it or you're faced with for example a penalty a charge for not fighting climate change because now it is really again so it's not it's not a matter of opinion and saying you don't want to fight climate change again i'll move on to the glass glass climate part so at open six we add the glass climate part which showed the, our key matter for how we're going to fight climate change in the next you know five ten years and i and i'm I, I was really pleased with that although contrary to what some activists said that it was a failure i don't think often was a failure so we need multi-interaction multi-interaction must be promoted in the form of regional and international cooperation we have to you know cooperate together to fight climate change the global south countries must compete with the global north countries and we have we need to have more lasting trade agreements for example i've been speaking with african leaders on how to have you know um more of the the nafta in, in, in north america more of the eu deal we have to have that kind of initiative in africa for example that can promote you know trans technology transfer within regions other than just trying to export technology from a different continent and also choose deals in in Politically tense region. We've got you know many crises all over the world now that they've got political you know uh, agendas. We have to leave this other and um, this in incentive to begin to fight the real climate change, science and, ur and urgency. We we need we need money knowledge. We need superior knowledge to fight climate change because when you look at our whole way of living, our lifestyle, it it has got just all conventional um, initiatives in this process. So we have to bring in more new new science that can fight climate change. And I said there, the adoption of um, the best practical means. So we've got best available science, which is what we've got so far is our available technology, which is not really sustainable. So we need to bring in the new best practical means that can, that can take into consideration social, environmental and cost-effective patterns, you know, safety. So the recommendation I have is adapt adaptation. We need to, um, climate change, we'll, we'll fight climate change, isn't it? 
But as, as much as we're fighting climate change in the next 10, 15 years, we'll still see some impact. So it, that our efforts now will not really quench the, the impact now, but we need adaptation for us to be able to um, um, still survive at this particular transition phase. So we need more innovative climate solutions, laboratory research and funding, research on crops that you know, they've got drought and flood resistance. We need mitigation that can help us stop many of these things, ban fossil fuel use and all that. And if you look at, I, I showed um, a, 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 um, a pie chart here saying, you know, we focused more on electricity saying, oh, face out fossil fuel use for energy and all that. But when you look at um, um, the infrastructure sector, which is cement, steel and plastic, it has got 31% that's contribution. So rather than just focusing on just electricity, let's begin to look at cement, steel and plastic, right? because they make, they, they contribute more to CO2 emission other than just electricity but the key thing here is electricity can either to contribute to more in our fight against climate change that's why i think the agenda for facing out to more renewable energy resource yeah thank you very much wow thank you so much oh my goodness i feel uh we could have given you a whole day um there's been so much content in there and so many perspectives and insights it's just been fantastic so thank you um and I think we really value the fact that you could bring some insight from what it was like being at COP as well. Um, we've got a couple of questions. I'm aware we've run over time a little bit. So I've had a look at the questions and I've sort of um, combined them or kind of grouped them together. So if you, are you still there, Romoyono? Do you want to, if you stop sharing your screen, we can see you because we've got a couple of questions. If you wouldn't mind answering them for us. There you go, brilliant. So um, um, the first question, um, you talked quite a lot about, um, I think kind of that skewed representation of the climate conversation, both in COP and outside of COP. Um, is it a young person versus um, the older people? Um, so it's kind of understanding, how do you think we overcome that very shortly? <laughs> how do you think we overcome that? And is it sort of structural change system, you know, that we're looking for? Um, but yeah, you, it's interesting to think about that sort of skewed or imbalance within the representation of the climate conversation and to see what you think the solution is for that. Yes, I think the young people can fight climate change now since they've got the energy and the, and the passion now to make more lasting impact. And also for the older generation, we can really fight climate change. We've got the last bit of strength in us to make that legacy. So, so it's just more of, um, generation knowing that they've got less time to fight climate change and younger generation knowing that they need to step up by getting by getting knowledge that's why i really think that so it must not be a fight against the young versus old but more of a collective effort okay thank you um another question that came through um again i'm going to combine this with another one so you know you talk a lot about awareness and knowledge and um you also talked about hope but it's hope enough we need to have courage and i think some of the questions came through wondered whether our young people mainly do they have the awareness and the knowledge which they seem to have but is that translating into the change that we need so are people having that courage to make the changes to some people gave an example to stop flying and to to stop buying all this um throwaway consumption and fashion and things like that so do you think there's do you think we still need to think about how to translate that awareness and knowledge into action Yes, yes, I think so. I think that, you know, not many youth are really, you know, aware. Like I said, awareness by consciousness and awareness by knowledge. So as much as we are aware, as in seeing it on Instagram or, you know, Facebook, we need to be aware of what it really is. Because once we are aware of what it is by knowledge, then we're able to make more informed decisions than just, you know, um, just talking about it or taking precise actions. So if you are aware by knowledge, then it motivates you to plant trees, it motivates you okay. to join organizations that, you know, it gives you more interest in taking courses that have got sustainability in its focus. So it's not only about environmental science, for example, talking about sustainable health, sustainable finance, sustainable agriculture. So it's cut across many things. So it's not yeah. just fighting climate change, but uh, a system change, like I said earlier on. So that's why I think. Okay, so you're saying that sort of having that real knowledge and understanding will then 
make people more yes. inspired to act rather yes. than just having an awareness. Yes. Great. I just got one last question and we have some others that we will come back to maybe at the end of the session because I think I'd like everyone's feedback. Um, so you've talked about um, kind of knowledge and awareness. What do you think are the most effective sources of knowledge and awareness or knowledge, I guess, in this case, um, for young people? Yes. So, so there's a huge knowledge gap between the transition from conventional practice to sustainable practice. There's a, there's a knowledge gap. But I think it's something we need to invent. That's what we talked about as youth. We say we've got the skills, we've got the expertise. But what skills? That's where I begin to question myself. What skills have I got? And it shows you how to really expose yourself to these transformative ideas. So, for example, the, the stages at primary level, at tertiary level, at secondary level, you need to really um, immerse yourself in many of these things. As much as those lectures, for example, are not sustainable, but they can do a lot. So, science and innovation is not really all what we need to fight climate change, but it can really do a lot to fight climate change. So, joining organizations, you know, the, you know, the charities and all that and going for tree plantings, putting pressures, and also political participation is very essential. I think many youth are not focused on you know, politics, but for you to enforce many of these initiatives and ideas, you need to really be at the drawing table. You need to be really be at the drawing table, but you, can, you can't get the order by, by, by passion or by knowledge mm. and by being involved right from start. So what I, would, what I was telling myself is even next day, I'm going to be really involved in fighting climate change by being involved in politics more and also looking at the profit aspect of my ideas, not just passion, but the profit aspect of it. Because when you've got profit in it, then it's, it's, it calls more attention to it. When you're making profit, yeah. it, it gives you more confidence that you know what you're doing. So I think um, books also, reading books, because many of the books, when you read books also, it gives you that, it tells you that for you to really make change, it's, you know, it's, it's inward. And I, you know, I remember I read a book by, by Brian Tracy, he said, no excuses. And I, since then I've put myself that I can't really blame anybody for the cost of my lifestyle, but blaming myself and being able yeah. to take actions. Look at um, Mother Teresa will tell you, you have to go back and look into, into yourself. So when you begin to just, you must move more than just castigating or make, making emphasis on government, and even though we know they may not, they're not doing well, but when we begin to take actions by ourselves, we can, we can only marvel at all what youth can do when we are right yeah thank you yeah so i think i think what's come out from both of your talks um and i think maybe sarah might be able to pick up on this in her presentation we can pick it up later as well is that knowledge it to get that knowledge it seems to involve individuals having to actively seek out that knowledge rather than that knowledge being delivered to people so maybe this is where educational institutions come in and places like that so um great thank you um thank you so much we probably will come back and speak to you in a little while but i think uh, this is a timely uh, time to move on to sarah who can tell us about what it's um the importance of being a sustainability driven graduate so sarah i will um hand over to you just give us a shout if you need us to put anything in the chat regarding your links and things like that lovely thank you very much Emma. that's really um, good of you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's lovely to be with you today. I um, wanted to uh, spend some time talking to you about sustainability from the perspective of every student, really, and not just about people who are immensely passionate enough about environment and climate change to make it the main focus of their studies. As Mary said in her introduction, my name is Sarah Flynn. I work at the university in a central team, and one of my responsibilities is to help course developers across the university make sure that programmes that we are teaching students have um, the right knowledge and skills in them to enable students to succeed in the workplace. And I've spent quite a lot of time over my career preparing students for the workplace and I'm really pleased to say that over those years there's been a much more of an increased focus on environmental awareness and sustainability. And I wanted to share with you uh, why we think that's important and what we're doing really here about bringing that work forward a bit more at Hertfordshire. So for those of you who are current students, you might be participating in the Go Hearts and the Connect programme that Mary mentioned, our Connect Reading programme in her introduction, which is focusing on sustainability this year. You'll be familiar with the university's graduate attributes. So these are shared attributes that we hope students develop during their time with us here at Hertfordshire. And at the moment, there are two attributes there which I think speak very well to 
the sustainability agenda and our responsibility for acting on climate change. And that's around social responsibility and global awareness. And we've had our graduate attributes for quite a long time at the university now, and they're undergoing substantial revision this year. And it's been a really good opportunity to talk to students and staff across the university about what they think the general attributes of a graduate from Hertfordshire are going to need to be in years to come. So as an as a insight into what's coming our way when we refresh our graduate attributes next year, I'm really pleased to say that three of our headline graduates attributes really speak to the agenda that we've had for these COP26 and beyond sessions. So that's about ensuring that students are professionally focused, globally minded and inclusive, and importantly, sustainability driven. There are a series of things that will sit beneath that and alongside it, which will support those agendas um, around communication, around digital capability, around ethical decision making, something else that I think is important in this agenda, but also compassion and goal orientation. So really speaking to what our first two um, uh, contributors this morning have said, it's not a it's not good enough to be concerned anymore. You have to take action. You have to recognise what the action is that you can take as an individual in this regard. So where our graduate attributes come from, for those of you who don't uh, know uh, what we do in order to generate these, we do quite a lot of uh, research into the future of work, what we're being told from big global studies about what will be needed uh, from the future workforce in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And we're looking ahead to say, what are the shared qualities and characteristics that people entering into our not only the workforce, but the global community over the next few decades going to require. Part of that has been looking at some significant work, things like the UN Sustainability Goals, things like um, the Advance HE Education for Sustainable Development Framework that was released earlier this year in the UK and other reports as well. And I think it's really important that we uh, we have I, I take very seriously the responsibility of us as an educational institution to adequately prepare our students for the challenges that they will face in the future. And surely there can be none other, no other greater challenge uh, than the ones that we're discussing today. A significant piece of research that I wanted to share with you today, although it's a, a few years old now, it's one of the reasons that I use it in this context is I think it is hopeful research, actually. And I think it's very easy in, um, in this space to feel overwhelmed about the size of the challenge that lies ahead from us. But um, this piece of work by Drayson uh, was carried out across four years and included 27,000 students over those four years. And going back repeatedly to uh, around 50 organisations who recruit significant numbers of graduates over those years. So it gave us uh, both snapshot data, but also some small trend data in terms of people's thinking about the types of skills and attributes that they thought they might need in order order to work in a, um, a, the attitudes towards sustainability that would be required in the workplace, both the, the thoughts of the students themselves, but also of the recruiting employers as well. And it made for some interesting findings. I think a key headline here is whilst it's really um, it, it's it's absolutely humbling to listen to stories of, of, of students who have and graduates and alumni who've invested huge amounts of their time and their energy studying uh, subjects like environmental management, devoting their entire careers to it. What we're now starting to see is much more of a dialogue about how sustainability is not simply a requirement for people wanting to work in the environment sector. It's becoming a part of every sector and can be a part of every job within those sectors. And I think that's a really important message to send uh, to current students and colleagues working with students, that it's no longer a niche agenda. It's becoming a must have in all of these conversations. 
Now, the research that I just referred to did a really interesting uh, piece of sampling across their survey population and talked about the transferable skills that you might need to work in a sustainability driven way. So not diminishing at all the importance of knowledge when it comes to uh, sustainability and our knowledge of um, climate systems, environmental impact, environmental mitigations and consequences of our actions. The research was saying, well, actually, what kind of skills do you need in every job if you're going to think in a sustainability driven way? And I thought it might be nice to get a sense of what you as a group might be thinking in terms of uh, what those skills might be. Uh, so we're going to try and do a little bit of um, interaction here and there's always going to be a momentary pause. Um, so if you have another device with you or you want to open up another screen, we're going to use a website called Menti. So that's www.menti.com. Once you're on the website, it will ask you for an access code uh, to access the presentation that we're looking at here. And the access code which I think uh, that Zoe or Nana will also pop into the chat, is 76 46 91. So that's www.menti.com with an access code of 76 46 91. And what I would love for you to do is to have a think about the transferable skills that you think are necessary to work in a sustainability driven way. Have a, uh, and pop those in. You can, multi, you can have multiple answers. Uh, so feel free to, to type in uh, several if you'd like. And we can see some of those starting to come through right now. Uh, so I'm going to do that magic thing of, of pausing for a moment and waiting to see all your answers coming through. really great great to see some of your answers coming through here already I absolutely love the uh, open-mindedness that we see coming through I often think that we can get into very fixed ways of thinking either bound by our experience or our subject so it's really great to see that kind of concept of being able to think in an interdisciplinary way and work across the disciplines, these sound really useful. Some really lovely contributions from folks there. It warms my heart to see people uh, being bold and, and radical, and I think that's absolutely true. I had a really excellent conversation with some students recently, though, about the reverse of that and about how the quiet, persistent, um, nagging voice can also have a transformative effect. I think there's that um, un unattributed uh, sp speaking um, phrase of uh, if you if you think that something small cannot change the world, you've never spent a night in a room with a mosquito, which I think is a, a really interesting thing. And in my team at the university, I work in the Learning and Teaching Innovation Centre. Uh, we'll, we're known for two particular phrases. Uh, one is that we are always learning. And I think that that is something true of this agenda as well. And the other one is that we say nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. And I think that's the mantra behind our graduate attributes moving forwards, understanding that sustainability, environmental activism and climate change are no longer issues associated with people who simply work in those sectors, but they are things that are important to all of us. Thank you very much for those of you who've been contributing. I'm going to close that vote now and just move us on. But uh, there'll be another opportunity for a little bit of interaction shortly, too. So the research that I was talking to you about highlighted these as the kinds of skills. And there's a lot of overlap with the things that you as a group were identifying just there. Some things that 
I think we share across our disciplines in the university and that it doesn't uh, matter whether you're studying a health programme, a sciences programme, an arts or a social sciences programme. Um, there's the connectivity across these common transferable skills can be easily located in your programmes. So whether that's your analytical skills and your ability to problem solve, working with others to do it, Colleagues uh, on the session today picked up that adaptability and mindset. Again, some really important transferable skills. Short and long-term vision, I think, is something that we can work well with, uh, with our students to help you develop perspective about what initial steps you might want to take, uh, but what your longer-term goals might be as well. And I think the really interesting thing from this research was that uh, there was parallel um, surveying of students and employers in the research and the skills that the students were identifying as something that they thought were important for working in sustainability. There was a really high agree, strongly agree correlation with what employers were looking for. So that's one of the reasons why I describe this research as hopeful, because I think that our employers know what they're looking for and our students know what is important in terms of the state sustainability agenda in the future. So again, another opportunity for a bit of thought and a bit of interaction here, if we may. I think one of the things that we're going to do here at the University of Hertfordshire over the next few years is lay down a challenge to students to identify the sustainability challenges that are relevant in the careers and the sectors that they're choosing to go into and to think about what the sustainability related challenges are for the disciplines that they represent and the professions that they might be studying towards um, so whether you're training to be a nurse a teacher a solicitor uh, an accountant or whether you have an idea of working in a particular industry like the engineering sector of software design, um, film and television production, um, radiography, physiotherapy, lots of other subjects or even if actually um, you don't feel that you have a clear vocational pathway within your degree but you've got aspirations to work in a particular sector for a particular employer. I'd love for you to have a think about what you think those sustainability related challenges are for your discipline. And I'm going to open up the Mentimeter again for you to have a to, to make a contribution there. It would be really useful if you are speaking from a particular subject perspective and you want to make a contribution here. Just to pop a note. So if you're studying law, for example, you might just start your contribution with law and then right next to it, what you think the challenge is are for your discipline moving forwards. This is a really difficult question, so I won't be surprised if this is something that's difficult for you to answer. Again, we're working in Mentimeter, so if you've closed the window down and you want to come back to it, it's www.menti.com with the same access code as before, so that's 76. 4691. And I'm going to leave the floor open just for a moment or two to give you the opportunity to reply. I am conscious that it is a difficult question. Um, and I do have um, some examples that I can share if we don't have any from the floor. But I'd love very much for, um, for, for to hear your contributions for those of you who, who'd like to make them. So the presentation of the responses here is, is happening as a word cloud. This is an opportunity, if we had lots of contributions, we'd be able to see what might be the more dominant ones across our disciplines, but we can see the individual ones coming out here. I think some of the things are really interesting around budget and economy, and I think we touched on that in one of our earlier sessions about how um, Often we work in financially driven organisations and sometimes the longer term goals that require the heavier investments at the start are not necessarily made. 
But we can also see other examples around inclusion and who's brought in in terms of shareholders and stakeholders into those decision makings. Um, working in a very regulated environment where regulations don't necessarily um, have the same aspirations towards being sustainability driven as um, we might hope they would. I am more hopeful in that regard with our research into our new graduate attributes. One of our sources of information were the regulations from all of the professional and statutory regulatory bodies who accredit degrees at the university. And I was really gladdened to see the number of them who were talking now about a requirement for accreditation in those disciplines to include an understanding of environmental impact or sustainability. So we can start to see some bits and pieces coming through here. And I can see we've got people from subjects like law, from like politics, and we can see some really um, instant examples like environmental justice has come out there with law. But also we can see some more generic examples, things that we might not necessarily think about. So a lot of people who study law, if they don't go into practice as a solicitor or a barrister, but might use their law in the context of policy work or political advising, lawmakers who have a, a constant regard for sustainability will ensure that it becomes an embedded part of our approach to lawmaking in the country. If you're working in a subject area like, like journalism or the arts, environmental impact assessments of the work that we do are becoming second nature now in terms of um, production and, uh, and distribution. And our obvious subject areas like, for example, engineering, looking at, um, I think we had comments earlier about emissions and digital foot, uh, carbon footprints and carbon emissions, you know, making sure that that curricula pushes people towards more sustainable alternatives in the future. But even things which feel less immediately relevant. So for example, physiotherapy and occupational therapy, looking at the amount of assistive aids that are used in that discipline, where they originate from, can they be reused? Can they be recycled? What materials are they made from? So subjects that are not necessarily rooted in um, environmentalism, uh, environmental impact and sustainability are now starting to think that way a huge amount more. Thank you very much again for your contributions in this session. It's been really helpful, thank you. So just to finish us off really, another point from the uh, research that we were looking at um, is part of the survey work that went on in the research was getting students to think about where, how important working for an environmentally friendly employer is to them in the future. And they pose this question that you can see on screen here, that if we're thinking about a graduate career with a base £20,000 salary, if you were offered more money to work for a company that had a poor environmental record, or if you were offered slightly less money to work for a company with a stronger environmental record, where would the split lie in terms of uh, which students opted for? I think it's really positive here to say that the majority of students, um, you know, two thirds to, uh, of the students there would say, actually, we'd take a slightly lower salary to work for a company that has a stronger environmental record. And that over the period of the survey from, 20, um, from 2010 to 2015, the, that percentage increased. So that had shifted by about 7%. And I am absolutely certain that if we were to repeat that again, those that those, those figures would, would have shifted again more positively towards companies with environmental records. But there's still work to do. If we increase the money uh, differential from 1,000 to 3,000, the data is not as good. So we've got to really uh, keep pushing to make sure that we work with our students to say, when you're choosing a company that you want to work with after graduation, think about everything in the round. Think about what their approach is and why you might want to work for them. I certainly find it very easy to work hard for an organisation whose mission, vision and values accord with my own personal values. And I think that that's something that we need to spend more time talking to our students about. So really, just to finish up, these are my challenges out to our student body and to people more widely, perhaps. 
is start being more vocal, irrespective of whether you're coming from an environmental management discipline or you're going for a job in a sustainability sector. If you are if you are not in either of those, if you've studied business studies and you're applying for a job in a marketing agency, think about what questions you might ask of a recruiter about sustainability. When you get to the end of a job interview, you're often asked, do you have any questions? It's often a moment where we dry up, but I can tell you as someone who's done a lot of interviewing over the years, it's something that you leave as a final impression with the people who are interviewing you. So we've been encouraging people who are passionate about sustainability to ask questions. Do your research first, take a look on the company's public information and website, ask them a question about one of their sustainability projects, ask them about how sustainability fits into the work of the department that they're applying for. I can absolutely guarantee it will make you uh, form a, a, a lasting and a good impression in the minds of the recruiters that you're being interviewed by. And equally, if it's not such a, 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 an established setup as an interview, think about having a sustainability pitch up your sleeve. You never know when you're going to come across somebody who has a contact in an organization. It might be at a recruitment fair. It might be a very casual encounter. And you want to tell them in a very short period of time what you're passionate about what area of work you're hoping to do or what you want to achieve with your goals in terms of your career and your interest in sustainability. So these are two challenges that we're laying down alongside um, other work that's going on across the university on being sustainability driven. We think it's uh, a really hopeful and a really positive step that you can make irrespective of your discipline and what it is that you're studying um, whilst you're here at university. We think it's something that all employers are interested in. The research shows us that and, uh, and we hope that regardless of what subject you're studying, you'll think about how that subject connects with the sustainability agenda and how you can connect together your interests both in your subject discipline and in sustainability as you head into your career. Thanks very much. That's that's it from me. There you go. You know you can hear me. Yeah, I'm back. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really interesting and actually really encouraging to see how much you know the employment market and. and um, employers are, are beginning to incorporate sustainability mm -hmm. um, maybe as a driver and and thinking about you know something to think about when they're employing um graduates um so i just had a couple of questions and then we've got some other questions i think might be appropriate for everyone to answer so i'll give you one question um just for yourself at the minute and then we can maybe have a little bit of a discussion uh, so someone's asked um do you think uh universities um and other institutions have a role to play, for example, when they are holding graduate fairs and employment fairs in only including maybe employers who have a sustainability strategy or are sustainability, sustainability driven, 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 sorry. So do you think there is a responsibility there from um, the, those people who are kind of bridging mm. between the employers and the, and the graduates? I think that's definitely a step that people could take. I think first, the first steps actually half were one of the first universities to um, have a, a kind of go green attitude towards careers fairs and took very active steps in terms of asking employers not to bring lots of disposable um, tact effectively that was thrown away straight away afterwards um, that we stopped using um, big balloon arches uh, to cut down on the amount of plastic that we were using in terms of running them. Clearly the pandemic has seen a lot of that type of activity move online. Um, but I think, yes, I think the next step will be um, to, to think about what it is that, um, uh, what it is that we communicate to the employers that we want to work with um, about what it is that's important to us. We've already done that with our employers on the inclusivity of inclusivity agenda. We spent a lot of time talking to employers about why diversity and inclusion is important to the university. And I don't think it would take us down the line of um, exclusion, but I think we've always tried to take a positive approach and to so a communication to employers from universities to say, 
Our students are really passionate about this agenda and actually you'll get more interest from them if you come and showcase the work that you do that's related to your sustainability agenda, I think is an absolutely positive first step we could take. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? And I think even just communicating kind of that wish and if they have that coming from lots of angles, then that may be inspired change from within for them because they're seeing that that's what they're, they're, the audience is asking for. So, um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so I did mention I had a couple of questions and I don't know if um, Romeole and um, Victoria are still with us. Um, yes. But fantastic. Yeah, um, we're still here. Great, thank you. Um, the kind of just, so it's really interesting the way the three of your presentations have sort of painted this really comprehensive picture of what young people, um, kind of what they're faced with, what their role is, and what their considerations and challenges are. So um, yeah, really, really interesting to see how it's all kind of blended together. Um, you know, Victoria and Romeo, you kind of talked about the need for young people to take action and to acquire this knowledge, um, which empowers people to get involved. But it seems like this, um, you know, it needs kind of a conscious or a proactive commitment from people. Um, and I guess we've identified that there is this gap between those people who are actively involved and maybe studying these environmental courses and then the other people. I know some of the questions refer to <clears throat> how do we then engage with those other people because that's where we need to reach. Um, and I think, Sarah, that's when you mentioned about the Go Hearts and the, um, the graduate attributes. And that's a really good way to make um, the topic or the issue sort of accessible to everyone. It's it's not, you know, just the radicals who are thinking about it doing it. It's now something that is all of us, you know, we all have to be part of it. So I think embedding it into these sorts of things is really, really important. So yeah, that's really, really interesting. And I think between all these suggestions that you've all given, I think that gives people a really good um, guidance and motivation and hopefully inspiration to get involved in whichever way that they feel works for them. Um, so a couple of questions, sorry, I've written them down in a couple of different places. Uh, one was, um, I guess, links back to what I just mentioned. And I'd like to ask all of you, um, <clears throat> because I think you might have this from different perspectives. So there is that kind of gap and we are sort of thinking about bridging, you know, from awareness to knowledge to behavior change. And it's sort of, what's the one thing that if you kind of had this magic wand that you could do that would enable people to more easily go from awareness to knowledge to behavior change to sort of remove any barriers what do you think is that one thing that we need to be doing to 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 get through those stages so victoria maybe i'll ask you first okay yeah one thing would be um my reaction so um people get to see what i do and you know model after or adopt, yeah. So yeah, it's one thing to create awareness and another thing to, you know, actually have those things you're trying to create awareness work. Now, when I'm out there talking to people, when, I'm, when I live my life every day knowing that there's a bit of climate change, something that has to be climate change in my 24 hours, people see me, people hear me by my actions, by my deeds, so one thing I, I would um, I, I would say is my action. It speaks louder than anything. So that way they yeah. see the model, even without even um, having a verbal interaction with me. It could be a post on anywhere. It could be just a little write up somewhere, and then you know, people could actually adopt that. Yeah, brilliant. So it's kind of I guess making sure you're always communicating about it, but also leading by example. Um, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, just walking the walk as well. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Romayola, what do you think is that one thing that we can do to bridge that gap between awareness to knowledge to behaviour change? Yeah, I think it's um, engagement also. Engagement with different people that are involved. Engagement with their um, political leaders, engagement with indigenous people, with academic institutions, like as you said earlier on actions also, just that engagement. When you when you have the engagement, then you're going to be able to get information from this aspect, hear their views, get information from another um, maybe another group, hear their views, and look at how it can um how be, you know, how, how come out to a, a very unique goal. So I think engagement is very important. So those are also that you know are most affected. Let's engage them on how we can really help them um, fight climate change and yeah, 
reduce mitigation. Yeah. Great. And who do you think needs? Oh, sorry. Who do you think needs to drive that engagement? Does it need to come from, like Victoria talked about, grassroots le levels, or does it need to come from the politicians or the communities or schools? Where do you think this sort of drive? Yes, like, to become? so it, I think it would be more from those that are more aware to less aware. So, for example, the academic institutions to maybe younger younger children. You know, for example, in in, in the secondary school, in the primary school. The teachers are more aware about it, they're able to impact the students. In the academic institution, the lecturer is more aware about your concept of climate change to students. So I think it's more from more aware or more knowledgeable to be less knowledgeable. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah? I think for me, it's about education policy. I, it's not a quick win, but I, I'm I firmly believe that if we focus on the right things throughout the, the education journey, we get everybody um, in the right place where it needs to be for activism. There's a there's a subject that is compulsory in the curriculum in Scotland in schools called modern studies. I'm a massive fan of it and would love to see it taught everywhere because it is a combination of sociology, politics, geography, and something else I can't remember now <laughs> philosophy I think um, and it's taught thematically so it's it draws together elements and, and focuses on big challenges and and I think that actually it would do the world of good actually if we started thinking like that in our education policy right from the early years through to higher education so that education policy shift towards more interdisciplinary thinking um, then it becomes avoid unavoidable for everybody to learn how these worlds interconnect. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think um, the national curriculum is being revised and is being looked at whether they can in in incorporate sustainability back into sort of the underpinning principles uh, for the curriculum, which would be re really, I think would be, like you said, really important and really effective. Um, great. Well, thank you so much. I've just realised it is 11.30 and I'm just going to check we've got if there's any one last question. Um, OK, so someone has asked Sarah, this is for you. So we're flipping the question around and we're flipping it back to you. What do you think is the big sustainability related challenge at um, higher education? So in course curriculum or the role of PSRBs? Uh, what should higher education institutions and staff be doing or not doing? Again, I think it's about the interconnected agendas. I think um, when, they, when you're looking at strategy, so if you've got institutions who have, for example, global strategies in terms of enriching their curriculum, but their curriculum reach, look at what the consequence of that is. Are you doing that in the most sustainability and ethically driven way? Um, it's not to say, I think our... Um, uh, it's not just to say that we shouldn't be uh, doing those things. I think it adds an enormous richness to our institution. Uh, but I think we need to think about what we're doing. And I think we as institutions need to uh, get used to having more of an equal power conversation with our professional statutory and regulatory bodies to say, you are used to defining what it is, what it means to be a, a registered professional, whatever that is, nurse, engineer, teacher, we are expecting you to include the things that we need you to think about in terms of sustainability, in terms of environmental impact in your standards. We see that that's important. So I think we've got a, a very important role to play in making sure that um, the, the bodies who accredit and recognise our provision are on the same page as us, if not pushing us to be better. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And I, actually, I think there has been kind of that change is sort of starting to come because we've had people contacting us within the university from the law from business from nutrition from engineering from tech and they all want to understand how they can better embed sustainability into their courses so um, there is a desire and there is a, a want so the more holistically we can provide that the better it would be great thank you so much um we have run out of time if there's any other questions um left in the chat that we're able to maybe answer by email if we've got a name we'll try and do that um, if not, I can only apologise um, if you've asked your question anonymously. But uh, again, a really massive thank you to both Victoria or Moyola and Sarah um, for giving us time this morning. I, as I said, you know, I feel we should have given you a whole day because this conversation is, is enormous and we could have gone on forever.
I'm hoping it's given students mm -hmm. especially a bit of a flavour and a bit of inspiration to get engaged. So always put the email in the chat um, in case anyone would like to uh, know how to become more involved at the university. Uh, we